Hi again, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today and welcome to the June NCCEH Healthy Built Environment webinar. Um, and today's webinar uh, is titled Seeking Sustainability in the Pandemic Adaptations of Public Transit. Uh, my name is Anna and I'm a knowledge translation scientist with the National Collaborating Center for Environmental Health and facilitating with me today is Tina Chen, who is also a knowledge translation scientist at the same organization. Um, and she usually facilitates these webinars, but um, I'll be subbing in for the next little while. Um, and firstly, we would like to acknowledge the land on which we're calling from within the traditional unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, which includes Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh and Musqueam nations. And we're grateful to have the opportunity to live, learn, work and play within this territory. Um, again, just some housekeeping notes, please turn off your webcams and put yourselves on mute. Um, if you have any questions, please type them into the chat box on the side anytime during the webinar and we'll get to it um, during the discussion section after the presentations. Um, and today we have the great pleasure of having two speakers from Simon Fraser University, the Urban Studies Program, and they'll talk about their research project on sustainability and pandemic adaptations of public transit systems. Um, firstly, Dr. Anthony Pearl is a professor of urban studies and political science at SFU, Simon Fraser University, and before joining SFU, Anthony worked at the University of Calgary, the City University of New York, and Université Lumière in Lyon, France, and he received his undergraduate honors degree in government from Harvard University, followed by an MA and PhD in political science from the University of Toronto, and his research explores policy decisions made about transportation, cities, and the environment. And our second presenter is Leandro Correa, um, sorry, I don't know if I pronounced your name correctly, uh, is, and he is a research assistant in urban studies at Simon Fraser University. And Leandro is a Master of Urban Studies candidate at SFU and a Master's of Power Systems candidate at the Polytechnic School the university at the University of Sao Paulo. And he has uh, also an MBA in, MBA in Transportation Business Management. And Leandro is focused on the relationship between public transportation and the urban environment. And he has extensive professional experience managing urban transit in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Um, and now over to you, Dr. Perol and Leandro. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I'll be doing most of the talking, but uh, Leandro will uh, certainly be around for the discussion phase uh, to uh, address any uh, questions that uh, we might share between us. So um, this project uh, is uh, the result of a uh, research grant uh, that was um, awarded to uh, us both by the Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions and the Community Energy Association of BC. Uh, about um, last September, uh, we were given this uh, grant uh, in a so-called fast track uh, research project to look at um, climate implications of pandemic adaptations and impacts. And we chose to focus on the area that uh, most uh, uh, interests and uh, uh, captures our uh, attention, which is um, urban mobility and the way in which the pandemic uh, has uh, changed that. We um, decided to um, look at the combination of external disruptions from the pandemic and internal or endogenous adaptations in transit agencies that are uh, uh, out there trying to uh, keep uh, the wheels turning. And the metric, the key core metric that we wanted to look at was how all of this affect, affected ridership, the people um, taking public transit still during the first wave of the pandemic. Um, this is a lesson drawing study. It, and it is not um, a uh, strat strategic uh, translation to what will work or won't work in any particular location in British Columbia or Canada for that matter. That's the next phase that uh, we're currently uh, making progress uh, on. But instead, we decided to um, pick uh, four cities uh, out there that were being disrupted in different ways by the uh, pandemic. 
and look at their evolving mobility from different perspectives, focusing on public transit, but covering other mobility options, and then see how different responses at different times during our samples, uh, city samples uh, adaptation affected greenhouse gas emissions. That's something that the Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions is obviously very interested in, but also um, employment um, and equity uh, outcomes in those particular urban regions. Our data sources uh, for the uh, research came from um, transit agencies and other sources of urban mobility data like Apple and Google, um, and also the COVID-19 data from local health authorities at, in terms of the number of cases and deaths uh, in different urban jurisdictions. We also looked at the Oxford uh, stringency index and the measure uh, a consistent framework for measuring the um, ways in which governments have tried to control uh, the spread of uh, COVID um, through uh, restrictions on various kinds of social uh, activity. And we also looked at uh, demographics um, with uh, census data and local sources for um, uh, other uh, mobility and social indicators. Our sample for lesson drawing, which we'll discuss the selection next, was Auckland and Wellington in New Zealand. And in Cascadia, we picked Bellingham, Washington, and Portland, Oregon. We looked at uh, 15 candidates before selecting those four um, cases for our lesson drawing study. Um, we wanted to make sure that we could access their ridership data. Uh, so they had to have that uh, available or be willing to make it available. That filtered out some of the candidates because we couldn't get a, uh, the data for the first wave of the pandemic, which is what we were looking at. The second one was um, um, more detailed data on urban mobility from Google and uh, Apple and uh, uh, other uh, public opinion and travel behavior surveys, if possible, um, were important to uh, get in um, this, this uh, case uh, selection. And finally, we wanted some level uh, at the third level uh, filter that we used to uh, have a range that would be appropriate to British Columbia and Canada more generally. So we wanted a population range and a mode share that were certainly not identical, but uh, bore some relationship um, that would allow some of those lessons to be relevant uh, in uh, Canada. So that led us to the uh, uh, four, um, but there's also a category um, with a Canadian framework for classifying urban transportation. The Canadian Urban Transit Association has a, uh, a six group um, category, um, which ranges from the major big cities in, uh, in Canada of over 2 million down to very small um, local uh, communities with less than 50,000 population. Our sample covered five out of the six categories that CUDA identifies. So we're um, at least trying to be as relevant as possible to the vast majority of Canadian urban uh, transportation uh, uh, experiences. And this is how um, the four cases that we chose fit in to the uh, CUDA uh, grouping. Um, the uh, Portland uh, TriMet system, it's bigger, it's three counties uh, around and including the city of Portland, um, is the biggest if you include the entire service area and population. Um, then Auckland, uh, which is an uh, uh, integrated metropolitan city. Wellington is uh, uh, probably around the size, well, well, we'll look at some of the indicators, uh, that's in the medium sized area. And then Bellingham is just between the, the small and the, the uh, very small, it's on the border of, uh, of that. Here are some um, figures that give you a perspective on the cities. Portland's population is just the city population, which is comparable to Vancouver, but the um, service region for the agency is bigger. Um, Auckland's is comparable to the lower mainland uh, population. Uh, Wellington 
uh, population is about the size of Burnaby in uh, British Columbia. And uh, Bellingham is closer to uh, a Kelowna sized uh, city. So that's the range um, in the cases. And there's um, different other indicators that you can look at uh, as for uh, the types of modes and the demographics and population density. Um, again, I think we covered um, a range that covers the majority of Canadian urban transit uh, operations with uh, just four cases, but it's not meant to be um, totally representative either. Once we had our cases uh, uh, out, uh, uh, identified and, and uh, approved by our uh, research sponsors, we collected further information um, during the uh, pandemic and we were looking um, at policy issues like the fare collection, um, uh, logistical uh, issues like uh, whether um, uh, buses in particular were uh, uh, opened up for rear boarding through the back doors to avoid exposure to the operator, um, whether there was online occupancy data being made available either in real time or delayed to uh, people to know, you know which routes were busier, which ones uh, might be less crowded. Um, we were also interested in the service uh, patterns, um, whether there were adaptations, particularly reductions in service, um, and uh, also the uh, public health um, dynamics of whether masks were mandatory and whether disinfection and uh, other cleaning was being done and also whether it was being um, publicized and uh, um, reported out in uh, consistent ways. So we collected lots of information and we identified nine variables uh, that we could uh, identify across the four cases that could give us um, a, a snapshot of the uh, adaptation that was going on. And out of these nine variables, um, three uh, in particular turned out to be the most relevant uh, to um, connect with our ridership analysis. Remember ridership uh, fluctuations are the core indicator or variable that we're looking at uh, in this cycle of adaptation during the first wave. Um, fare policy, the dollar sign uh, showing um, free fares, which were available in three out of the four cases, everyone except Portland suspended their fare collections for part or all of the uh, study. Bellingham in particular suspended fare collection even beyond the uh, time period we were looking at. I didn't check uh, today whether they're still uh, free in Bellingham, but uh, they were for an extended period well beyond the first wave of the pandemic. Also, we were um, looking at uh, uh, the uh, return of the uh, early service cuts that happened to uh, some agencies, all of them uh, cut service uh, back uh, at the first wave, but some were quicker than others to um, put uh, more service back. And so that was a key uh, relationship that we identified. And finally, the uh, uh, mask uh, wearing regulation. So um, that was constant across all three. And you'll see um, later on, but to you know, keep uh, uh, not keep you in suspense, that we found out of our um, four cases, Wellington, uh, New Zealand, um, was the one that had the quickest and furthest fair, uh, ridership recovery out there. So uh, all else being equal, which it never is necessarily, one lesson to draw from their adaptation measures is that those fit best with the local conditions, which of course differ a lot between New Zealand and uh, Seattle, uh, the uh, Washington state uh, or Oregon um, situations. But uh, Wellington seemed to have um, the uh, most adaptive response out of these four cases. So once we had collected um, data, we uh, did uh, descriptive statistical analysis. We looked for relationships and correlations between ridership and various adaptive measures that were out there. We put all of that together. We're gonna cover those for you. And then those um, animated and uh, inspired a three scenario uh, development system for um, later pandemic uh, adaptation in 
urban transportation, which we'll walk you through. That led to us creating a transit resilience roadmap, which again is like a checklist of uh, measures that were tried in different places and ones that seem to have in those cases particularly successful results in restoring public transit ridership during the first wave of the pandemic. And finally, we did a very basic and um, inexpert compared to uh, climate scientists that picks my pick to uh, do the same type of work, projection of greenhouse gas emission savings from the adaptations during the pandemic in those four cases. Um, and that is not to say that uh, you would get the same results uh, with other places, including uh, those in British Columbia. But we just wanted, and our, our sponsors wanted, some snapshot of what all this meant in terms of climate impacts. So we did that, and you will see that in a while. So first, we'll look at uh, the uh, ridership, the, the number of people using all the different parts of these transit systems. And um, not all of them had rail, although most did. Some had ferry services, some had uh, paratransit of uh, various kinds, which means um, demand responsive uh, uh, trips for perhaps uh, you might know the term handy dart here in British Columbia, um, but there's other ways of doing it as well. If you put all that together, of course, uh, the earliest part of the pandemic, um, we see a, a plunge that's rather common between the four cases. Um, and uh, then we see um, the New Zealand cities uh, recovering until another wave or subwave of uh, infection and uh, restrictions hit Auckland, which is the red uh, um, ridership uh, line, and that uh, brought it back down to US levels, but then uh, recovering again as those restrictions were eased. So what we, what we see is that Wellington recovered quickest and stayed more um, robust in terms of its ridership. The uh, American cities, Portland and uh, Bellingham lost ridership uh, um, and have been much slower to uh, recover during the first wave of the pandemic. Here we see um, one way of um, interpreting this, the resilience that's uh, going on in uh, the four systems. This is all of the, uh, well, we've uh, broken out the different submodes, bus, rail, paratransit, ferries, et cetera. And um, you see the uh, variation between the, the lowest point that they reached of their ridership, which in some cases was almost, well, was 100%. The uh, must have stopped the ferries entirely in Wellington for a period because they lost every rider on that. Um, and then the, the highest recovery, then, which when they put the ferries back, uh, they got back to 98% ridership, as you can see. So this shows the, uh, that that's a lot of resilience in Wellington, and it happened rather quickly in just two months to get the speed of recovery was quick to go from losing it all to getting almost back to pre-pandemic uh, ridership. But we looked at it across each mode. Then we started looking at uh, correlations between ridership and uh, we uh, had four lenses or perspectives that we used there. Um, we uh, found that uh, ridership was most highly correlated at the causal level with the stringency index, the measures that governments, public health uh, uh, agencies like those that many of you work with put in place to prevent uh, transmission of the virus. That was the consistent single largest um, correlation with uh, effects on public transit ridership um, and much greater actually than the actual number of deaths or cases uh, of the virus in particular in these particular cities. Um, we uh, also looked at um, the uh, correlation of ridership between other kinds of mobility indicators. And here we see a a clear break between the New Zealand cases and the American cases that we were looking at. Um, in New Zealand, both Auckland and Wellington, there were consistently high correlations. Uh, when public transit ridership was down, then all the mobility indicators um, of both transit and 
uh, other modes, walking and, and automobile uh, driving, also went down very much in unison. Whereas in the American cities, when public transit ridership went down, uh, the transit data that came from these uh, apps on Google and Apple were highly correlated, but not the ones with uh, either active transportation or walking in particular or driving. So um, public transit in the US was uh, not um, linked as tightly with other modes of mobility as it was in the New Zealand cases. Here we see where people were uh, going and uh, how that was connected with uh, the use or reduction of use in public transit. Um, in, again, in uh, the New Zealand cases, there was a consistency that uh, going to work, going to uh, retail and recreational destinations or groceries and pharmacies, those all were fairly highly correlated with transit uh, ridership in a uniform pattern less so uh, a bit in the United States once you got beyond the, the work trips. Um, the non-work trips were a little bit less uh, correlated, um, particularly the grocery and pharmacy trips. So people were obviously making other modes to uh, access that uh, those activities when transit was uh, reduced. And finally, we looked at um, the correlation between ridership and um, uh, whether people actually stayed at home or, uh, or not, the residential um, uh, activity or location uh, of uh, uh, people using these uh, apps and also their um, ability to, uh, to go to parks uh, and be identified geospatially as uh, making those kinds of trips. And here you will see that um, uh, the uh, New Zealand and American cases, again, look quite uh, uh, different. Um, in uh, the uh, ideal situation, we'd want people to uh, be uh, staying uh, uh, at home, uh, having a neg strong negative correlation with uh, transit ridership, but then um, maybe um, using transit or um, going uh, to uh, parks as well, that would be a positive one. And you see more of that in um, New Zealand and you don't see that people are not using transit if they're staying at home to do uh, recreational or non-work um, trips to, uh, to the parks. Here we put it all together in this so-called radar graph, the correlations and, and coefficients to see which um, types of activities, destinations, um, or drivers of um, um, the context are highly correlated with um, uh, transit ridership and which ones are not consistently correlated. So the ones on the uh, right side of the uh, graph, uh, the radar side of the circle are the ones that are highly correlated um, and uh, the ones on the left side, you see much more variation in the relationships again with New Zealand cities uh, tending to show a consistently different pattern, which you might well expect because of their consistently different pandemic uh, experience, uh, uh, even during the first wave, uh, uh, much more modest uh, uh, impacts and lockdowns and restrictions uh, along the way. So um, there we can, um, sort of get a sense of the consistency and the diversity in our data set. And that helps us, I think, figure out which areas um, we can be stronger in our um, inferences for lesson drawing compared to ones which we uh, see more uncertainty and maybe can draw inconsistency, I should say, and maybe can draw distinct lessons from the New Zealand cities versus the uh, American cities. Again, the uh, converging ones uh, are on the right and the diverging ones are on the left. We then um, spent some time working on behavioral data from surveys to see what people's mindsets were in these places as best we could determine. 
um, and whether that was related and driving effects on public transit ridership. We had good, very good uh, uh, behavioral data from uh, the New Zealand cases, um, the uh, uh, New Zealand uh, Transit or Transportation Agency had time series surveys, which they were asking riders, uh, people who moved around in different ways, but in this case, riders of public transit, what their concerns were. And you can see um, that uh, the concerns um, actually had a higher indication in Auckland, uh, a higher correlation with transit ridership than the actual number of COVID cases that were out there. So um, it was people's um, uh, expressions and understandings of concern that were important and the same in uh, more important than actual experience with the disease. And the same was true in Wellington, slightly less. We didn't have identical data to work with uh, in the US, but we did find a, uh, an Oregon State Health survey in which 87% uh, of their respondents in the area that Portland, the TriMet uh, organization is, said they were very or somewhat concerned about COVID-19 and 68% uh, said they were very or somewhat concerned about becoming sick uh, for COVID-19. So again, concern was standing out as a, a quite a, a high um, a behavioral focus uh, in these communities. And um, in uh, Whatcom County, which is the area where Bellingham Transit's uh, operations focus, um, again, very high um, concerns, 86.6% said they were extremely or somewhat concerned for their health during uh, the first wave of COVID-19. Um, this is not from Cascadia. We had to go further afield to find this transportation risk perception uh, data, but the University of uh, Illinois at Chicago did a survey in the first wave early on that uh, asked people about the perceived risk of traveling by uh, various uh, modes. And you'll see that particularly the uh, understanding of risk with uh, personal motor vehicles and public transit uh, is pretty much inverse, um, that uh, uh, most people felt the personal motor vehicle had an extremely low risk for uh, contracting COVID, whereas most people thought that uh, public transit had a, a high or an extremely high risk of contracting COVID from using it. So uh, this was the perception that was uh, quite um, clear from um, the survey in Illinois and the Chicago area in particular. Once we uh, uh, had gathered and started to organize all of this data, what were our key findings? Well, I mentioned that we um, did an estimate of uh, greenhouse gas emissions that were saved or not put out compared to pre-pandemic mobility across all modes in our four cases. So that's the, uh, the number we uh, came up with. Um, it was an annual savings uh, across the four cases that we looked at. And what would that look like in BC? We know that that wouldn't be something you could translate directly. Although if you add, look at the population total of our four cases in our sample, it's um, about a million less than the population of British Columbia. Um, and uh, if we take a direct proportion, which is totally uh, arbitrary and uh, not uh, uh, what I would say is the uh, end result you would want for this type of greenhouse uh, gas uh, analysis, you could see um, that it would be even greater um, in British Columbia if the exact same experience in these four cities were to average out here. And uh, um, we also see that the transportation sector in British Columbia, at least as of 2018, was uh, contributing 27%, well, the, uh, the vehicle, the light duty um, vehicles powered by gasoline were contributing 27% to our total greenhouse gases. So that's just to put it in perspective. Now we uh, move beyond greenhouse gases to look at uh, equity. And um, we wanted to identify how the changes in transit service um, would result in 
impacts for uh, the population both who had used public transit and maybe future um, users of, of public transit. We found, um, again, lesson drawing that uh, the places that um, kept fares out, uh, didn't collect them long for the longer periods of time, and at the same time increased their service capacity back to pre-pandemic or closer to pre-pandemic uh, levels. Those were um, the most resilient. Those were the ones that recovered the most ridership in sustainable mobility. Um, and we also found that uh, working from home was uh, a big factor, certainly on the greenhouse gas uh, impacts, but that it was um, highly correlated with socioeconomic factors um, such as income, race, and education. In other words, the more you had of uh, income and education and the less you were a visible minority, the more you were likely to work from home and then um, contribute to the uh, um, greenhouse gas savings. Uh, but that's a very uh, skewed uh, uh, segments of the population. Um, there was one particular uh, service that uh, we highlighted from Bellingham's case called zone service. This is a form of paratransit uh, where uh, vehicles go into low density, um, mainly rural uh, areas um, with advanced bookings and pick people up um, on a fixed route, but uh, at specific times. In other words, people who need to access health or social services or other essential trips would book uh, in advance and then be told uh, within a time window when to show up for the uh, bus that will meet them um, on their fixed route in their areas. Uh, this is generally used by people who have very little uh, alternatives to uh, mobilities. So um, that's uh, uh, something that um, uh, was the most resilient. The people who used the zone service as soon as the service was ramped up again, came back with the highest uh, level of uh, recovery. More generally, uh, so essential mobility um, uh, is a uh, uh, robust um, component of uh, adaptation. The people who depend on public transit do come and continue to use it uh, if it's restored for them. They don't find other ways of uh, getting around, mainly because they don't have other ways of getting around. We also found more generally that uh, buses were more resilient than other modes uh, of public transit within the different options, rail and ferry and that sort of thing. They showed lower decreases in ridership, again, maybe because the user group for buses had uh, fewer options, such as working at home, by, uh, because they are often a, uh, a lower income or uh, uh, more uh, essential workers and, and don't have um, as much alternatives, except in Portland, where it was about the same between rail and, uh, and bus. Um, and buses have recovered their uh, riders faster. Um, again, I think because they're serving people with fewer alternatives. On the employment uh, side, um, we uh, noticed that mobility restrictions and transit ridership were highly correlated with uh, uh, workplace travel. Obviously, the more restrictions that were in place, the fewer trips outside the home to work were, were made, and the people who had uh, the ability to shift worked from home and didn't use public transit. Um, in uh, New Zealand, they also didn't drive, whereas in the US they did. So that's an, a, they must have found other ways or other needs to get around with their cars, which is significant. But we found that working from home can be a game changer in travel behavior, um, that uh, looking forward, the more flexibility that people have for different types of journeys and different schedules when they do work from home could um, help transit agencies adapt and recover ridership outside of the traditional peaks of commuting. Some transit systems are going to a more full day continuous uh, level of service as opposed to the very sharp uh, high levels of service in the morning and the afternoon commuting peaks uh, because people are not commuting as much to work. Um, we think that 
um, as far as employment goes, uh, we also noticed a big impact, a difference um, in terms of ridership and the actual service and employment levels of the public transit agencies. And if we're going to keep transit agency workers going, um, we, which we feel is important to avoid a permanent migration from collective to uh, shared to private uh, mobility, um, then um, public transit availability is really important to keep those workers in the public transit agencies working on the payroll. And that enables job market access for those who are in essential services, particularly those who don't have transportation alternatives. We found one study from New York City, the uh, transit agency there that said that job losses in transit were correlated with a projection of 20 times more unemployment in other economic sectors. So for every job that the transit agency eliminates and cuts back because of permanent reductions in its activity, that's 20 other uh, jobs um, in the community that will also be lost. Then we went into scenario analysis um, and the main drivers of our scenarios were vehicle kilometers that were traveled and what modes they were uh, uh, on. We came up with uh, uh, three scenarios. Um, uh, and again, um, looking at three dimensions, the equity, the employment and the greenhouse gas uh, projections. And uh, we basically rather crudely thought that uh, we should look at scenarios as having better outcomes, comparable neutral outcomes or worse outcomes. So our first scenario um, was labeled sustainable transportation. Our second one was business as usual, coming back to what we were like uh, pretty close to the pandemic start. And the third one is coming back with even greater auto dependence uh, in uh, a, uh, an urban uh, area. So those were uh, the three and uh, the key indicators, uh, whether vehicle kilometers travel went down, stayed roughly the same, um, or whether they actually increased and whether more trips after the uh, pandemic or certainly after the first few waves of the pandemic would be using active transportation and public transit as opposed to driving, whether it would be about the same as before or whether public transit would um, be permanently reduced. So here we have the sustainable transportation scenario in which we both in the short and the long term see more sustainable mobility outcomes uh, in our cities. On the equity side, uh, that um, scenario depends on remote working and studying becoming more widespread and continued after the pandemic. Um, and that public transit uh, services uh, are also quickly restored and improved so that people will use them for some of their trips, even when they're working uh, from home and not commuting for that purpose. Um, that that will probably require um, for uh, essential workers and low income uh, travelers to have incentives in place to use public uh, transit like free fares or reduced fares, um, which would, and on the employment side, that would support the economic uh, recovery by um, enabling essential workers to uh, get out uh, and about um, without driving and putting out more um, pollution. Um, and uh, giving people opportunities to access new jobs uh, with uh, public transit as well. Um, and on greenhouse gas emissions, we would preserve the savings that we already identified that uh, have come up uh, in the four cases by having less mobility uh, for work trips and more modal shift for non-work and for the remaining work trips to more sustainable modes, less uh, personal motor vehicle. That's the uh, greenest scenario. The business as usual bounce back is not uh, looking as good, especially in the short term. There we would see um, that uh, uh, public transit slowly grows back to where it used to be, um, but uh, the affordability and accessibility of transit doesn't improve, particularly as a result of the pandemic. Um, none of the um, 
uh, adaptations become a priority on the policy agenda. So things like free fares or um, encouraging special arrangements for essential workers or those who aren't able to uh, work from home, those are not addressed um, as policy priorities. Um, and when it comes to uh, employment, uh, there's going to be at least in the short and medium term, well, short term, some uh, job losses uh, and financial losses that transit operators have to deal with. They might come back slowly um, toward pre-pandemic levels, but it could take a while for that to, to happen. And we would expect um, uh, the greenhouse gas impacts to be negative, both in the short and the longer term, because more people will be finding um, alternative uh, alternatives to active and sustainable public transportation, which basically means um, driving. We did not do a technology assessment about electric vehicles. I know some people think that that's going to solve all our problems, um, but we did not include that uh, in the uh, scenarios. And finally, um, the greater auto dependence uh, scenario, which basically means that um, public transit uh, uh, stays uh, uh, down and out and continues to decline as a uh, mobility option for urban transportation. <laughs> and that this um, leads to lower employment, both within the transit um, operations and if you believe the correlations with other types of uh, employment because people have less ability uh, to access those uh, job uh, resources. And finally, the um, greenhouse gas emissions go up substantially as people um, get out there and make up for lost uh, time and uh, effort uh, during the pandemic, um, at least in the short term and probably in the medium term, um, generating uh, more uh, GHGs through uh, private motor vehicles with internal combustion engines. So then we don't have a lot of time left. I'll just very quickly um, look at the transit resilience roadmap. It had six um, dimensions to it, uh, the core concepts, um, and uh, we feel that each of them can draw on best practices from what we saw in the lessons that worked in the four cases that uh, we looked at. So if you were to say, take what they have experienced in their different uh, outcomes and take the best of all of them, this is what you would want to build in. And this is an example, and the report is available um, of, uh, online where we um, had recommended strategies and tactics. Um, some are policies uh, indicated with a, an orange P, some are operational, uh, uh, and um, obviously the, the two need to connect uh, with each other. There were four general dimensions of um, the kinds of uh, uh, types of uh, ways to manage the system more effectively. We called it multi-system management. And in some jurisdictions, we saw that policy guidance, strategic uh, planning and sustainable transportation focus were all um, being managed together. And that was the best practice that helps um, make uh, the uh, adaptation to the sustainable transportation scenario more likely. We also found that optimized travel demand was, uh, there were some good practices uh, there um, in terms of uh, managing the uh, uh, influences that uh, led people to choose one way of getting around or another. Um, and multimodal urban um, solutions that were presented to people. Quickly going on to technology, we saw there were three um, types of technology uh, uh, change and adaptation, um, defensive uh, technology to guard against the pandemic, things like cleaning, disinfection, um, and avoiding overcrowding, attractive technology, which brings um, people into uh, um, better knowledge about what's going on in the system so they're not as scared uh, about overcrowding or disease on the system and open data which allows researchers but also public uh, and uh, government to all see what's working uh, effectively so those were technology um, outcomes accessibility um, we talked about uh, the uh, fair policies service adjustments 
and like the uh, uh, zone service in Bellingham, um, putting priority on essential mobility services for people who don't have um, options by making those priorities. We uh, saw accessibility lessons that could be packaged together into a strategy. Safety, of course, and here we're talking not just about the regular safety of the operation, but the health uh, safety. Um, those are uh, essential. Without those, the others uh, would be undermined. And uh, finally, communication. It's not enough to be safe and equitable and uh, coordinated and doing a great job. One also has to um, engage with the uh, urban population so that uh, people see the results and uh, are uh, convinced that it's transparent and effective uh, what's being done. So that's uh, uh, pretty much uh, where we wound up. Um, we have uh, a literature review in the back of our report that talks about other experiences uh, beyond the four cases. Um, and uh, we're always happy to uh, hear from people both in discussion and uh, afterwards. Uh, I'll just uh, use my uh, email. You're welcome to reach out uh, in the future, but uh, looking forward to your questions and the discussion. So thank you very much. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much, Dr. Carroll. That was such an informative um, presentation. Um, we'll now go on to um, discussion. And um, if you have any questions, please type them in the chat box and we will um, pres um, have the um, presenters um, answer them. And we also have some predetermined um, questions for discussion and I will share them on the screen. Sorry about that. Just trying. Anna, to... do you see an option to yeah. share a screen? Yeah, I do now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, here it is. Okay. Yeah. And if you have any questions, feel free to type into the chat box. Um, so the first question we have is, how could different messages about mobility enhance resilience in urban transportation? Um, yeah, Dr. Pearl or uh, Leandro? Well, uh, maybe I'll let Leandro have a chance to uh, speak up uh, on this question. He's uh, been looking much more closely at weekly reports from around the world about how transit agencies are recovering and adapting. So Leandro, maybe you have something you'd like to say about this. Well, um, for what we saw in our, in our study here is that some mobility messages that are, are given for the authorities or governments, they have a direct impact on how urban mobility happens in, in, in the everyday life. So, we saw two very different scenarios from US cities and New Zealand cities. And that could be correlated to how governments were uh, informing the population about restrictions and, and if you should stay home or not. Like we saw in, in New Zealand cities, they had a much more strict message of staying, staying home orders for, for the population. And we saw that during these messages, during this phase, we all the uh, uh, transportation modes, they had a similar pattern of, of usage. While in the US, we see like Professor, Dr. Perk just show us a different pattern. You had um, uh, low levels in public transit, while you have an increase in driving and walking. So uh, different modes with different impacts from uh, public message on, on 
information in general, I would say. I'd like to compliment with something, Professor. Um, it seems that in the US, when uh, the message was to um, stay home, people thought that that meant stay home and avoid others on public transportation, but uh, that it was okay to go out and do their own thing. Whereas in New Zealand, when the message was stay home, people just stayed home, period. Um, that uh, seems to be an obvious uh, uh, difference. And I don't know if it's the way the message was communicated or whether it was the way it was received. I imagine there was a bit of both of that and where Canadian cities would fit between those message uh, um, dynamics is another question to be considered. Yeah, that is an interesting difference um, to uh, observe for sure. Um, does uh, any, yeah. Um, does anybody have any um, questions to add to that or any comments? Um, yeah, and if not, we'll um, go on to the second question. Um, and the question is, what are the risks and opportunities of changes in travel behavior that could influence future use of sustainable transportation modes? Andrew, do you want to start that one too? Yeah, sure. Um, I think that this, in, in my opinion, was um, the most useful outcome of the study because we saw that out from a very uh, first, a drastic change in, in travel behavior caused by the pandemic, we could actually see some good opportunities for, for the future, like if we can change our, our metrics, the way we travel, if you can reduce the number of trips and maybe invest in sustainable transportation modes so we could have a much better opportunity for a future, for a green future, for sustainability in general. So uh, I think that now, uh, in, for me at least, it was clear that if we invest in, in sustainable transportation modes now, it's reachable. I mean, what we say that we can save in, in terms of uh, our GHG emissions and other types of pollution, we can reach that. But of course, it, it's not easy. It, it takes a lot to do that, but we need to find the way of how we can connect A to B and, and, and get the savings. Yeah. The uh, experience in uh, all of our cities showed that um, working uh, remotely um, and uh, using active and sustainable transportation for trips spread more evenly throughout the day has a huge impact uh, on um, greenhouse gas reductions, which is not the only dimension of sustainable transportation, but is a big one in today's uh, climate emergency. So um, the big question, um, it's uh, to be determined in the coming months will be whether um, we keep some of the uh, adaptations in uh, working and uh, uh, the type of travel, uh, particularly commuting travel that uh, people uh, used to do compared to what they've done during the pandemic. And that could also um, extend to the uh, location of work. Um, people don't necessarily need to be um, all in a single metropolitan area if uh, remote work continues for some uh, positions and some activities and some firms. And we've uh, seen that uh, people who um, work from home, again, even if they're maybe um, in a different location from the uh, traditional office uh, space, um, have contributed to significant um, sustainability improvements. Whether that continues, whether we sort of adapt and keep those uh, patterns or head in those directions or just go back entirely to um, pre-pandemic uh, behavior will make a big difference. Um, and uh, going back is uh, a, a higher risk um, for the future of sustainability in our cities, I think. Thank you, Dr. Pearl and Leandro. Um, does anybody have um, 
any comments um, about that particular question? Um, yeah, if not, um, we can go to the next question. Um, or we, Anna, Anna, there's a there's a question in the oh, chat there, box. Oh, there is. Oh, that's right. We do have one. Uh, in, yeah, we do have a question from a participant. So Wellington certainly stood out in comparison to other urban centers. And in your analyses, did you examine baseline characteristics of transit users prior to the pandemic? Um, in other words, were there something, was there something different about New Zealand's attitudes and actions that drove their continuation of urban transit adoption independent of pandemic constraints? And please let me know if you'd like that repeated. See the uh, the chat, uh, Leandro. Do you want to talk about um, uh, the baseline uh, issue? Whether we had data from before? I mean, we were yeah. comparing it with uh, the year before, I believe. But how far did we go in the uh, baseline? Yeah, I think that one um, one possible answer to this comment is based on on the trends mode use in, in, New, in, in Wellington, it is the highest one. If you compare with the slide that you showed in the beginning, what we have, how, how much is the percentage of trends used in each of the cities, Wellington stands as the best one. They have 18% in comparison to, let me see here, 6% in Portland, 10% in Auckland, and 3% in Bentham. So, this could be related somehow, but we we didn't go further to to study like travel behaviors uh, out of this census analysis. So uh, we just compared the ridership from uh, 19 to 20, and then we made these assumptions here. But it might be related to how trends is. Uh, uh, link it to the mobility in the city. So public transit was already playing a bigger role in urban mobility in Wellington than in any of the other uh, of the four cases. And um, we, we found that um, the agency uh, and government responsible for that transit um, was the most generous uh, policies of, in the adaptation in terms of not charging fares for a longer period during the um, early recovery from the first wave and also restoring the service, putting it back. You can't um, ride public transit if it's not there. And you also, um, some people, as we saw, because of concerns about um, infection, which were greater than the actual infections and in their influence, if they feel that the uh, buses, the few buses that are left running are too crowded, they're not going to use them. So Wellington, seems to have reset its uh, transit operations the quickest and had the most attractive um, incentives to come back and try it out uh, as soon as the uh, first wave of the pandemic was sort of um, under control a little bit. Those seem to be relevant lessons from that particular case. Well, thank you. Um... Um, and we also uh, have another question um, from a participant. Um, can you speak, please speak more about the climate change benefits related to a more to more balanced transit use throughout the day versus spikes at peak times? It's really interesting. Sure. Um, well, um, commuting is uh, uh, maybe efficient um, for. Uh, the economics of agglomeration, but it's not a particularly efficient uh, logistical pattern. If you have to um, have 15 buses uh, ready to take everyone downtown within one hour in the morning, uh, as opposed to a bus running 15 every 15 minutes throughout the day for trips that are more evenly distributed, it's just much less um, fuel and uh, uh, inputs of energy that are needed at those peaks uh, uh, and um, less um, negative uh, environmental impacts as a result of it. So um, transit, uh, although um, it has an economic efficiency of cramming as many people into the vehicles during the peaks as possible, also has 
higher impacts and higher costs uh, for having all those extra capacities at peak times traditionally associated with the morning and the evening weekday trips to work. If we're heading into a future that uh, doesn't have um, sort of 90% of the population all trying to get um, to the same place at the same time, um, then we have a lot of opportunity uh, twice a day uh, for work. Then we have a lot of opportunity to reduce the um, greenhouse gas emissions, both from transit, but even more from motor vehicles, because uh, when they're all inching along in heavy traffic, they produce more um, greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, again, this doesn't take account of, well, what if they're all electric? Um, I think that's a, uh, a long-term goal to have for uh, uh, the uh, future of both transit and uh, private motor vehicles, but it's probably not going to happen fast enough to do all the uh, good things that we want from electric mobility in the time that we actually need them um, to prevent uh, big climate uh, disruptions for the uh, future. Yeah, that is really interesting. Um, thank you, Dr. Pearl. Um, and uh, we do have uh, one last um, preset discussion question, and that is um, reducing car trips during the pandemic was the main driver behind the peak production of 3,000 tons of CO2 per day in our sample of four cities. What future alternatives could reduce travel volumes of private motor vehicles to achieve an ongoing level of greenhouse gas avoidance of a similar magnitude? Well, that kind of picks up on the uh, discussion we were just having. Uh, and uh, as I suggested, uh, it seems to me that uh, adapting the uh, way in which and the uh, times in which we uh, access workplaces and work time activities um, was a big part of that savings during the pandemic and will could make a big uh, difference. Uh, uh, prevention rather than cure. If we um, just uh, continue to work uh, uh, from home to some degree, we will be uh, much closer to um, our ability to uh, uh, manage and prevent uh, uh, climate uh, destruction in the uh, future years ahead. That was the single biggest uh, um, impact from um, uh, sustainability, environmental sustainability of the pandemic in these four cities. And I suspect it's not that different in Canadian cities, although that remains to be determined. But uh, I think it would be important to quantify that in Canadian cities and other places too, um, so that there can be a clear understanding of what's at stake uh, in our you know, uh, build back better approach to uh, taking what uh, we've had to uh, do by necessity in the pandemic and understanding the value of keeping some of that uh, uh, resilience and adaptation going forward. I think some people want to continue to have the uh, flexibility of remote working. And it turns out in most cases, that comes with a huge environmental bonus and benefit uh, to society um, in urban areas at any rate. So um, that's something that needs to be clearly focused on uh, by public officials who might otherwise just be worried about, well, there won't be as many people buying coffee downtown and uh, you know, there's real costs for that. Those are distributional costs and some people will be impacted negatively if we don't all jump back uh, uh, on, on the road uh, at uh, 7.30 every morning to uh, get to work in the same place. But we should make sure we understand what the um, greenhouse gas implications of um, commuting at peak times are for the future versus the kind of remote work that uh, became a much bigger part of uh, urban life and urban mobility during the pandemic. Mm. Oh, thank you, Dr. Pearl. Uh, it's uh, yeah, a balancing issue uh, for sure. Um, we have one more um, comment or uh, from, oh um, yeah, and question from a participant. Um, just an observation. It seems like the lessons learned around waiving fees, restoring services to previous levels, open source data, et cetera, would benefit other, other local sectors as well as part of 
equitable recovery efforts. In Vancouver, the public libraries are waiving late fees right now. Have you found opportunities to share your findings to other sectors? Yep. Um, thanks, that's a great observation. Um, we've published this report. It's uh, uh, for, for us, uh, uh, we don't have uh, people like Anna and uh, Tina, these uh, knowledge translation uh, specialists. Uh, we uh, academics tend to treat our work like uh, messages in bottles on uh, desert islands. We sort of throw the message in the bottle into the ocean and see who picks it up uh, someday. Um, so it's out there. Um, we are currently working on a study that tries to extend the lesson drawing uh, that we've been doing here to Canadian transit adaptation. And uh, we are going to be uh, later this year convening what we hope to uh, call a transit uh, adaptation advisory group, TAG, which will consist of um, people who work in urban public transportation across Canadian cities to start to see once we have even more robust analysis of what's worked uh, in other places and what hasn't um, to see whether they feel some, most, all, or none of that is relevant or doable in Canada. But I think you're onto something when you see how public libraries have adapted um, their uh, fee structure. And I think public transit, um, there's a window now over the next year or so to adapt their um, fee structure, people will need some incentives to do the right thing uh, in uh, uh, post-pandemic or late pandemic uh, uh, return to various activities. And I think it's uh, the more that um, we can learn from what's worked in other places to get people back on the bus, um, the more chance we have to have a uh, a greener and more successful outcome in Canada. So I hope we will be able to have that dialogue. And I hope some more people like uh, from today's session will pick up our uh, bottle and open it and look at the messages that uh, we found uh, in these particular cases that we looked at. Um, thank you again, Dr. Pearl. Is there, um, does anybody else have uh, any more comments or questions? Uh, uh, feel free to also pipe in um, to uh, turn on your audio and pipe in as well. I just wanted to also mention that um, the NCCH has written a blog on this topic um, related to Dr. Pearl and Leandro's uh, research. Um, I will put that a link to that blog in the chat box. Oh, that's great. Thanks, Tina. Um, yeah. um, okay. Uh, It'll be very interesting to see what strategies um, are developed in the future. Yeah, for sure. Let me just put that in. Yeah, so Tina just um, put the link um, to um, the public transit blog that's uh, on the NCCH website. Um, yeah, um, so so if there are um, no more questions, um, yeah, I just wanted to thank you, um, Dr. Pearl and Leandro for sharing your work with us. And thank you for everyone for joining us today. We actually, uh, we have an evaluation for this webinar and I'll post it right here for, it's in the chat box. Um, and uh, if you uh, wouldn't mind filling it out uh, at your convenience, we'd really appreciate that. And the recording of this webinar will be sent to um, everyone who's registered for it um, soon. And I'll also send the um, evaluation uh, link again. Um, and we really hope you found this webinar to be useful and inspiring in your work. And we'll share the recording with all of you. Thank you for joining us and uh, have a great week.